we're going to uh, finish up the Battle of Britain, okay? And so you guys remember, uh, the, the Germans, the Luftwaffe is going to lose 71% of their air force in this six-month battle, okay? Now, every time the Germans came across the channel, who was there to meet them? Royal Air Force, yes. And... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and this plane. Okay. This is the British Supermarine Spitfire. Okay. Um, this is the best fighter of the war. Okay. Um, what's unique about this aircraft, which was designed by a guy named R.A. Mitchell, uh, is the elliptical wing. Okay, so if you look at most World War I fighter aircraft, you have a boxed wing. Okay, it's straight edges. Okay, box wings are easy to mass produce. Creating an elliptical wing like this, manufacturing that, is time consuming. Okay, the designer, R.A. Mitchell, guys, while Billy Mitchell back in the US was trying to convince our army to invest in attack aircraft. R.A. Mitchell was designing the fastest plane in the world. Okay, they used to have contests in Europe. Who could build the fastest plane? Now, they flew these. These were pontoon planes, okay, because they flew these over water because you're racing. You know what I mean? You don't want to do that over land. Okay, um, so um, this design uh, includes a 1,000 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine in it. Okay, with four machine guns mounted on the wings. Okay, so you can imagine guys trying to, you know, fly behind another plane and shoot it down as that plane is moving and maneuvering. It's hard to actually hit the other plane. So having four machine guns mounted makes a difference. Um, this plane is fast. It's maneuverable at high speeds, more maneuverable than the Messerschmitt. Okay, their, their counterpart. So as the Germans sent bombers across the channel, the Hawker Hurricane and the Spitfire were there to meet them. And they were downing these German bombers like crazy. And then they were downing the, the German fighters. And Hermann Goering, who's in charge of the Luftwaffe, okay, he's the plump fella. He's kind of fat, but if you ever look at videos of Hitler, you see a big heavy guy next to him. That's Herman Goering, okay? He's in charge of this. And he goes to his fighters, his fighter pilots. It's like his best aces. It's like, what is going on? Why are we losing this air battle? And, he's, and, and he told Goering, he said, listen, give me a squadron of Spitfires and we'll defeat the British. But they didn't have a squadron of these, okay? The British had. Okay, even though the German pilots were much more experienced in air combat, this was the better plane. Okay, and so, guys, pilots were of great importance. Okay, how many hours you got in a plane, Cooper? 22, that's it? Yeah. Okay. How many hours do you think it take to train somebody to fly in combat missions? Hundreds of hours, okay? They can build a plane faster than they can train a pilot. So they would encourage the pilots, if their plane is hit, it's going to go down, eject from the aircraft. Don't worry about the plane. It's more important to save the pilot. Okay, there were days, guys, when the Germans would send waves of bombers, one in the morning, another in the afternoon, another one in the evening. So the, the British pilots, the RAF pilots, would fly multiple missions a day. Okay, they come. They go fly, take on the Germans, land, go get a pint of beer, something to eat. Bell rings again, you're back in the plane. If you got shot down over the English Channel, they'd come pick you up in a boat, get you in a plane later in the day after being shot down. Okay, They had a shortage of pilots. Now, the first American to die in World War II was an American civilian pilot that wanted to go fight, but it was illegal for U.S. citizens to go fight. So we had civil American civilian pilots going to Canada to 
get fake papers, fake passports, saying they were Canadian citizens, they would go over and fly for the RAF. Now, when you watch Pearl Harbor, in the movie, Ben Affleck, who's an army pilot, goes over and flies for the RAF. That didn't happen. We didn't send our pilots over there. Civilians went, okay? And one of them was a famous, like, uh, Olympian. He was a bobsled, gold medalist, okay? And he went over there and flew. Um, so with, before too long, you had an entire squadron of Americans over there flying called the Eagle Squadron, okay? Um, you had Polish pilots, like people that Polish pilots that had escaped, Czech pilots. Uh, so they were taking whoever they could get to fly for the RAF, okay? This is going to hold off the invasion, okay? Operation Sea Lion, phase one, air superiority over the channel in southern England never happens, okay? So Churchill said this about these pilots. He said, never in the course of human history have so many owed so much to so few. Those few were the pilots of the RAF, okay? They saved Western civilization. They saved Britain and therefore Western civilization. So combined with radar and an air defense system, a complicated air defense system, okay? Radar stands for radio detecting and ranging. Okay, like this is pretty primitive stuff. So, you know, sending out radio waves, they bounce off an object, they come back. Okay, and then you try and interpret that. Now, the guy that invented this for Britain, there's a movie on Netflix. I forget the name of the movie. It's pretty good. I mean, this guy had to lie, cheat, steal equipment, money to get the things he needed to, to figure this out. He was a weatherman. It should be a national hero, okay? Now, radar was invented about the same time also in Japan, okay? Um, as this is the thing, like, this is why smart people are important, okay? Again, like, there's a problem. We need to solve it. We need to figure out a way to survive, you know what I mean? And so uh, this is one of those times. Now, the British will share this radar with the United States, okay? So we will get it as well. So the Royal Air Force, they intercept the bombers. Now, when the daylight bombing didn't work, Germany switched its tactics, and they started bombing at night, and they started bombing the cities. This is called the Blitz. The British always come up with good names for stuff, okay? The Blitz. And it's well documented, guys. This is this is brutal. Uh, incendiary bombs on cities, uh, civilian targets. They're trying to bring Britain to her knees. Okay, trying to get them to surrender. Churchill's not going to let that happen. Okay. I got a couple of video clips I want to show you. Um, not quite as good as Top Gun, okay? But uh, we'll see. I'm going to show you a reenactment of a dogfight between a Spitfire and a Messerschmitt, okay? It's decent. It's in color. And then uh, a video that will kind of show you what the Blitz was like, okay? And when they started bombing Lin London and other cities, okay? Once you get these notes down. How many of you guys have seen The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Okay. Blaze, you haven't seen it? Narnia? Kind of fantastic. I mean, it's fantasy, but it's got a real good message behind it. You can see how slow this is awesome. And 
he was a legend. It's I mean, C.S. Lewis lived during this time. You know what I mean? Like, he lived through this. He was given radio addresses in London during the war okay? uh, about all kinds of different topics. A lot dealing with Christianity. But, yeah. Okay. So that's a Messerschmitt spent shooting at a Spitfire right there. That's southern England. You see the white cliffs of England there? Pretty cool. That summer, like, the skies were, were very clear that summer, um, which normally over Britain it's not. It's raining. So uh, some people like, claim a little bit of divine intervention there. So you could see the Germans come in, hear them, uh, spot them, and take them out. Um, so uh, next video uh, is... From the opening scene of Narnia. There we go. It, in the movie, it's just it's dark. Uh, it's hard to see. But so these are the German bombers at night. Guys, the, the British started doing blackouts. Okay, any of you guys ever flown at night? Okay, you can see where the cities are at night. You know what I mean? Because all the lights. So the British really took these blackouts seriously. Like, you got in trouble. Like, if you emitted any light from your home. Okay, so everybody put stuff over the windows. They blacked out all the train cars. All the windows on the train cars were blocked out. Buses. Uh, they, the headlights of automobiles, street lamps were taken down. Guys, they took down every sign, city street sign, or, you know, when you're driving K96, you know, Hutch, 43 miles this direction, right? They took down all the signs. So, like, if the Germans used paratroopers, they wouldn't be able to use those signs to know where they were, okay? Um, they took this really serious. Um, but once they heard the bombers over the city, they started using spotlights to, uh, to, to try and shoot them down. 
Okay, so that's why you're seeing the spotlights during the blackout, okay? They've already reached the city, so might as well try and shoot them down. Up in all kinds of trouble. That wicked queen, or what is what is she? Ice the ice queen. She's horrible. Uh, anyhow, uh, so yes, the beginning of this movie, uh, and then the kids will be sent off to the countryside, right? Um, so the the I have on the next few slides just like some pictures um, that explain a few things. Um, now this map here shows uh, the Germ the Germans were able to you know use air bases in France, you know to attack, but also from Denmark and Norway attack Britain. Okay, and so the British, like I said, spread out their airfields, they hid them, and so forth. And uh, man, every time they came over, they you know the Germans were met uh, by force. Okay, and this is just an artist uh, depiction of Spitfire and a Master Schmidt there over this other over southern England there. So I mean, like if you were a farmer in southern England, man, that six month period, you look up every day, man. There's there's dog fights going on in the sky above you, and bombers flying over, you know, uh, every day. It, it was a tough time for the British, but what Churchill called it was their finest moment. Okay, and he got on the radio and he talked about standing up and 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 not surrendering. Um, Churchill did not leave London during the bombing. Neither did the royal family, guys. The royal family could have gotten out of there. They could have gone to Canada. They could have gone anywhere. They stayed. Churchill, as you can see in this picture right here, he's out amongst the people after a bombing run in London. Okay, he's there with them. He ran the war from London. In fact, if you go um, today, where'd it go? Okay, I'll find it. Um, yeah, here it is. If you go to London today, uh, if you ever get a chance, uh, if you're in London, go check out the War Cabinet work. Okay, it's very inconspicuous. It's a row of like apartment buildings. There's, the street ends and there's a park. You go around the end of the apartment buildings, go down the stairs underground, and it's where Churchill ran the war from, okay? And uh, you can see his bed sitting in there. He would work from his bed from like to a left in the map room where everybody is. He slept in there. And um, 
Worked till about 11 from bed, then he'd get up, he stayed up late. Um, and they left these rooms exactly as they were when the war ended. So it's like stepping back in time. Okay, it's pretty cool. That's not right. So, if you're ever there, um, definitely, you know, one of the tourist attractions to do. Obviously, you want to go see Buckingham Palace and, you know, the dudes with the funny hats, you know, protecting the king now. Okay. Um, this is part of that quote from Churchill. Uh, Never was so much owed by uh, owed by so many to so few. Okay. And then the kids. Okay, so guys, uh, the movie Narnia, you know, they send the kids off. Um, the timing isn't exactly right here. So, guys, once Germany invaded Poland, that's when the British started sending the kids out of the cities to the countryside. The government requisitioned over a thousand estates, like Downton Abbey, you know, like an estate in the countryside, um, and told those people they need to take in these kids. Because mom, what's she going to do during the war? She's going into the factory. She's working in the factory. Where's dad going? He's going to fight. So you got to take the kids out and get them out of the cities. Because they were fearful that the Germans would bomb the cities, and they were right. Okay, But they sent the kids so early. Remember the phony war for six months? So they started sending these kids off, and for six months there was no fighting in, in Europe. And then it took another almost three months, nine weeks, for France to fall once the phony war was over. Okay, Then the bombs start dropping. Well, guys, the kids were impatient. Like, they're like, I want to go see my mom and dad. And kids started running away. And going back to London and Coventry and to, you know, Liverpool, Manchester. And the kids started running back to their families, and their families weren't there. The parents were gone. Okay, so when the bombs started dropping, these kids, they're like on their own. And from what I read about this, guys, you had like bands, gangs of kids. Like 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. Like, they would steal food, and they would, you know. They, they were a nuisance. They were a bunch of hooligans running around, okay? Um, so that was kind of an interesting societal effect, uh, having a country under attack like this, okay? And no parents around. Um, so moving forward, got some more pictures. Okay, so in the movie, that movie clip I just showed you, the family ran into the backyard, right? And they got in a shelter. Okay, that's actually called an Anderson shelter. Anybody that wanted one of these in, in England could get one. You dig a hole in your backyard about three feet deep, take this corrugated steel, and you bolt it together at the top, and you get out of your house during an air raid. Okay, because if you're in your house and your house comes down, you're probably going to die. You're a lot safer in one of these, three feet underground. Now, the one in the movie's really nice. Like, they had carpet and stuff. I mean, most people didn't do it that nice, okay? Um, and if you go to London today, there's still these in people's backyards. They just have, like, gardens around them and stuff like that. Okay, they're still there. Uh, back then, I mean, if it rained, you know, mud gets in there. You got food stored in there just in case. Rats, you know, cats and stuff in there. It's kind of... Wasn't real sanitary, but hey, man, it could save your life. So the Brit, uh, the Germans started using incendiary bombs. Uh, so you can see like buildings coming down. Um, you know, I think it's uh, St. Peter's in uh, London. The, the it's a big church with a dome, like our capital. Uh, it survived the bomb, the blitz, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, but the, the Germans were bombed during low tide, making it more difficult to get water out of the Thames um, and to, to put out fires and so forth. Uh, and then you got these things, these balloons. Anybody know what these are called? And what, what, what's the purpose of these balloons? 
called barrage balloons. Okay. Uh, a bad one here. Okay. So it's not the balloons so much that are the thing. It's the steel cables that are the thing. Okay. So you would put these balloons around like an airfield or around radar stations. Remember those Stuka dive bombers I talked about? Guys, you don't want to dive bomb into a bunch of steel cable. Because if your wing hits one of these things, what's going to happen? It could rip your wing off, or it could send you into a spin. Either way, you're going down. Okay. Now, in these days, kind of cool, a little parachute would drop, pop out, okay, and create drag on that cable, okay, if it didn't rip off your wing to start with, okay. So German uh, dive bombers avoided balloons, okay. These would be manned by uh, a group of about four women that would put these up, okay. Now, you could put them on top of buildings to get them higher and so forth. Um, German bombers would fly just above them, okay. So... When you're trying to shoot them down, figuring out what altitude you want your shells to explode at is helpful. So if we knew how high the balloons were, that could get the shells to go up above the balloons, okay? And hopefully take out some of these German bombers. You saw in the video the anti-aircraft fire going off, right? Um, so that's these were pretty cool. Guys, at the peak, they had over 2,100 of these flying in the skies over England. A lot of freaking balloons, man. Okay. We actually put up a few of these on the west coast of the United States during the war. Okay, fearing the Japanese invasion. Okay. Uh, and you can see London Bridge back here. That's kind of a cool slot. So barrage balloons, you know. Listen, guys, when you're getting bombed every night, you wake up in the morning, you know that, hey, you're trying to do something to protect yourself. You're not just sitting ducks. Okay, it's psychology of it, you know what I mean? Because people, a lot of people want to give up. And, you know, you're doing something to protect yourself, okay? This is a picture of a, ra a radar station on the southern coast of England, okay? Like I said, this is pretty primitive, <laughs> all right? Um, now, if you could afford it, you could buy, like, this steel box. It's like this desk, but it's made out of steel. Steel's expensive, especially during the war, okay? Now, you put a mattress inside of this, put some chicken wire up. You could sleep in your home during an air raid, okay? If the house came down on top of you, you know, you, it would hold. They just have to dig you out. Like, hey, hey I'm in here. Okay? They have to dig you out of there. Okay? You see people sleeping in there, okay? Other people um, in the cities would go into the, into the tube. Uh, now, the government really didn't want people to do this, but you're not going to... There were air raid shelters, but just not enough for everybody. So people would go into the tube. The problem here is that some of these tubes are built just a few feet under under the ground. So, like, underneath a road. So if a 500-pound bomb hit the road, this whole thing could collapse, trapping and killing people. Uh, and that did happen. Okay, Another place you don't want to hide during a bombing raid is under a bridge. Bridges tend to be targets, okay? So you don't want to be under the bridge when it comes down, okay? Find a ditch or, or something, you know? I mean, get get try and get underground, but um, yeah, you don't want to be there. And then this is a good picture of the spotlights uh, that they use, and that would be manned by like two or three man crews. I got another picture on the next slide of a better one of those. Yeah, right there. So this one's like, it's got little tracks on it, so you can move it. Uh, have any of you guys ever seen one of these, like, in real life? Do a bat symbol. What? Do a bat symbol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, Spangles, uh, or sometimes when there's like a big, uh, like, opening day, opening night of a business, they'll hire one of these. And they, they used to do this in Wichita. Spangles did, and you'd see the spotlight. Downtown Wichita, okay, pretty cool. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, those are pretty neat. 
Um, now, the kids, uh, this is a gas mask. Okay, all the kids were given gas masks. They get a name tag, an ID tag, get one suitcase, kiss mom and dad goodbye, put them on a train off to the countryside. Okay, so ladies your age, guys, you would be doing one of several things. Most likely at your age, 17, 19, they're going to send you to the farm to work the farm with the old men because the young men are all off in uniform. Okay, Somebody's got to help grow food, and they're going to have a shortage of food. Okay, They're going to get cut off. We're going to end up supplying them eventually. They'll be cut off, so we need to, uh, farm help. We need to take care of those kids, those 3 million kids. Somebody's got to watch after them. The young women will do that. Uh, young women would put up the barrage balloons, okay? Old men farm and would be the home guard to make sure that blackouts, you know, people weren't, you know, they were a nuisance. Like these old men would be walking around the neighborhood and they'd find you and they'd yell at you, make sure you weren't letting any light out, okay? It was, it was very important because that saves lives. When, when the Germans can't find the cities or your town, it saves lives. Okay. Uh, they're going to find London. Okay, but if you live in a, in a you know a medium-sized town from the air, they may not see you if there's no light. You understand? Okay, this this is very important. Okay, and there were a lot of accidents because of the blackouts. You can't see where you're going unless the moon's out. Like people falling off of bridges into the you know the rivers, drowning. <laughs> Fall, you know, the curb, you know, you fall running into things. I mean, like I said, I've read a lot about this, and you know, there were a lot of accidents, okay. Um, but they took it seriously. And then this is a, this is a British, the British called an ack ack gun, ack ack, and these are what they would use to try and this air defense system to try and shoot down German bombs, okay. We'll see this again a little bit later. We talk about the V1 and the V2 rockets. Uh, they're, they're actually able to shoot down some of the V1s with these things, which is pretty cool. Like, pretty good target practice, man. Okay, if you've ever done trap shooting or something like that, okay, uh, shooting a flying bomb coming across the sky at 500 miles an hour. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, guys, 48 million people, backs against the wall, okay. How are they going to survive? Everybody had a job, okay? And uh, I find that really fascinating, historically, um, how the British were so stubborn and would not give up. And uh, the leadership of Churchill and the royal family uh, got, it through, got them through it. It was their finest hour, okay? And uh, them surviving will allow the new world uh, to come in and help liberate Europe uh, four years Later. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a pretty important story, the Battle of Britain. Hope you enjoyed that. Okay. Oh, I'm not done. Sorry. Not done. The British get a little bit medieval here. Okay. They're kind of come up with some interesting ideas. Now, this is a rocket. Okay. It's actually called a parachute and rocket. Okay. And so, like, you say you had an airfield that you wanted to protect. You hear an air raid coming. Fire these rockets up. They each have a steel cable attached. And then a parachute deploys. Basically creating a wall of steel, steel cables. Okay. Now, parachute and cable system. And so um, if a wing hits one of these, same thing. You know, a little parachute down here deploys. Okay. Creating drag. And all the reading I did on this. I only heard about this working one time, okay? And it ripped the wing off a German plane, the pilot crashed, and the townspeople came out with pitchforks and got it, okay? <laughs> it's the only time I read about this working, okay? But it gave them some satisfaction, you know? Now, the Germans tried these, tried to cut through the cables, okay? It didn't work out too well for this plane. Now, Let's get medieval. All right. So in the video, first video, you saw the white cliffs of England, right? So if the Germans are going to invade the island, sorry, 
They're going to invade the island. You're not going to want to land landing craft where the big cliffs are, are you? Because the British could just stand up at the top of the cliffs and shoot at you. You know what I mean? So you don't want to land there. So the British knew generally where the Germans might try and land, bring in troops, okay? So you guys know what PVC pipe is? It's like this white plastic piping. So they took this PVC pipe, and they drilled holes in it. They put it out in the water where they thought the German landing craft might come. And in case of an invasion, they could pump oil into that PVC pipe. It would coat the surface of the water and then ignite it. That's what this picture is. They were practicing. Okay. This would, I mean, if, if you had a landing craft here, it would incent, I mean, it would blow up, the gas it would blow up, everybody would die. You know what I mean? This would work. And I'm real glad the Germans didn't think about this. But think of this. Like on D-Day, when we land in France, on the beaches of France, in Normandy, the Germans had this, we would have been doomed. We're already doomed. You know what I mean? It was crazy difficult, okay? But that would have been made it a lot worse, okay? Here's another one. So one of the things that uh, British feared, you know, the Thames River runs up here into London, okay? <coughs> And um, they thought, you know, it's big enough to get your Navy up there. And so, I, I know we live in Kansas, but out in the Thames River, okay, you got, if you're ever out on the water, you see one of these things sticking out, painted red. What is it? Yeah, it's called a buoy, okay? For those of you that have never been on water. Uh, now, if there's a red buoy and a green buoy, you stay between the red buoy and the green buoy. You go outside, it's shallow, and you're going to run aground. Okay, so stay between the two. Well, underneath this, guys, is this big platform with pontoons. You pump the water out. This thing comes up out of the water, and you got machine guns and artillery on top. To destroy the German Navy coming up the Thames River. These are still out there today. One guy went out there and claimed it as a country. Went out there and climbed up on it and said, this is my country. <laughs> Not making that up. Okay. So we got, I mean, they did all kinds of stuff. Like, remember we talked about dragon's teeth? Guys, there's a bunch of golf courses in England, right? It's, you know, the birthplace of golf, right? England, Scotland, right? So they just took like old, they, they emptied the junkyard, like ca old cars, refrigerators, and just built up barriers uh, so that tanks couldn't move across those golf courses and stuff. I mean, they took old oil barrels and put spikes in them, coated it with lime that would make it flammable so that they could roll them down the hills at the Germans as they came off the beaches. Okay, like all kinds of stuff. Um, they just got creative. Okay, thankfully they never had to use that because of the radar and the RAF, you know. But uh, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. Okay. And now we have crop dusters with uh, with rockets. Okay. Let's.